appreciate you taking the time to be with us. I'm Josh Salzberg, co-founder of Lutheran's Racial Justice, and I'll be moderating a conversation with six guests who have graciously joined us this evening to share their perspectives and their personal experiences. Uh, we'll meet them in a minute, uh, but first, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the organization Stop AAPI Hate released data that 3,795 incidents of harassment, shunning, and physical assault against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders had been reported to them since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these are just the incidents reported to this one organization, so it's more a glimpse at the problem than anything. Um, but shortly after this report was released, there was a mass shooting targeting three massage parlors in the Atlanta area. Uh, six of the eight victims uh, were Asian. And to say that race was the only factor in that tragedy is, is definitely an oversimplification, but to say that individual and cultural biases played no role or to ignore the impact that the shooting is, uh, has had on Asian American communities uh, is to give permission for these incidents to keep happening. The truth is this may be a new conversation to some of us, uh, but anti-Asian hate didn't start last year. Uh, from the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 to Japanese Americans being displaced in internment camps to the 1982 murder of Vincent Chin, the United States has a long legacy of scapegoating Asian Americans. So I'd encourage you, uh, if any of those events sound unfamiliar, um, to be honest, as some of them were to me, I encourage you to read up on this history because in all of these cases, broad cultural animosity towards Asian Americans was a contributing factor. So when we say never again, we're not just calling for intervention from government and religious leaders, we all have a responsibility to confront our own biases and dismantle racism within our own homes, communities, congregations, and schools. With that in mind, um, I'm so honored uh, to have with us tonight uh, this, this great panel um, uh, of, uh, of great speakers that we're gonna get to hear from this evening. Uh, I'm just going to introduce them very briefly. Uh, Dr. Joel Okamoto of Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. Um, Sarah Sayang, also uh, working in uh, admissions coordinator at uh, Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. Um, Tim Beyer, uh, LCMS pastor at Tacoma, Washington. I want to make sure I got that right because I, I inadvertently said Seattle before, and, and Tim did assure me that that you know, locally would cause some issues. So Tacoma, I want to make sure I have that. Uh, Reverend Travis uh, Yee, uh, LCMS pastor in Glen Clove, uh, New York. Um, Kevin C.K. Berg, theater director and actor at Crown College, Minnesota. And Dr. Ruth Whiteford, uh, adjunct professor at Concordia, Irvine. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, a real quick word before uh, we get to the questions, uh, just a bit about the panel discussion format. Um, we're going to keep to an hour long. We're definitely not going to cover everything that there is to talk about in an hour. Uh, but in the first half, uh, we're going to have one question per panelist. And uh, the second half, we're going to open it up to uh, a Q&A where we'll invite the audience to ask questions in the comments section. Um, and the conversation will be a little less formal. Um, and so please uh, join in the conversation in the comments section. Uh, the LRJ team is there to be sharing some resources and, and be part of the conversation and offer some context through the discussion. Um, two quick reminders for our audience as we dive in. Um, we just wanna specify that you know Asian American as we're using uh, in, in the name of tonight's panel discussion, it's a catch all term, uh, but Asian Americans are not a monolith. Uh, there's a diverse array of cultures and experiences and perspectives within that catch all, including, including those that we're gonna hear from uh, on the panel this evening, uh, but please remember, they're not here to represent all Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders. And then also the purpose of this panel isn't to debate Asian American history or litigate whether or not recent incidents legally qualify as hate crimes, but to listen and learn from the experiences and perspectives of this group. Um, so diving in, um, thank you to uh, Dr. Okamoto uh, for, for being here. Uh, this evening. I uh, just wanted to say real quick, in the fall, you wrote an article for Concordia Journal subtitled uh, Christians and the Language of Politics in the Dark. Uh, in it, you make suggestions how Christians can better engage in political discourse uh, during divisive times. And uh, you suggest how Christians might better engage uh, divisive issues like abortion rights and police violence. But tonight we're talking about a subject matter that I assume you know is a bit more personal to you. Uh, do you have any advice on how Christians might engage engage this issue if uh, if they should at all. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Josh, and to all of you who are here. Uh, yes, of course, this is personal in the sense it has to do with uh, my identity and uh, my everyday life. 
Uh, and yeah, I, I do have some thoughts on that. And some of them, actually, I'll share just a couple right away. And these I've actually shared also with my uh, sisters. Uh, so one would be uh, for everyone, this is Asian Americans uh, in the church and outside the church. This is for Americans in the church and outside the church. Uh, here are at least a couple. Uh, so in, in especially in our times, uh, we have to do more for uh, working for increased trust. And uh, we should start with each one of us. And one of the key ways of doing that is displaying empathy. And I mean by that, just being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Uh, I talked about my sister. Uh, one of them texted me about this, uh, gave me an example. And it's, it's just one she gets sometimes in the church. How long have you been a Christian? And that's not one that every visitor or member of church gets. And uh, I've had that one too. Uh, but in thinking about that from, you know, my perspective, uh, what if, you know, what if I ask that of you? How long have you been in the church? How long have you been a Christian? Uh, especially if, if if you're a Missouri Synod uh, member, lifelong, uh, that would sound a little weird. Uh, but think about that. That's one. And another with these kinds of things uh, is to display what I guess I'll call objectivity. Uh, that's the ability and the willingness uh, to let the conversation be about a topic or a problem and not about yourself. Uh, and on, on this, uh, it, it's, it's something like this, having the conversation get to somewhere where uh, people say, that's right, not you're right, or that's wrong, not uh, you're wrong. The discussion has then been about the problem or the concern. And on something like this, which has to do with your identity and uh, brings in things about life that uh, you might not even reflect on, uh, but but deeply matter. I, I think that kind of thing uh, really matters. And let me let me offer those right off the bat about talking. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and, you know, speaking of I identity, you know, and uh, uh, things being personal, um, Dr. Whiteford, um, I know you uh, grew up in Oklahoma uh, in a, a predominantly white church body. Um, and, and with that in mind, you know, did uh, you felt feel pressure or have you felt pressured to um, act in a certain way? Uh, you know, in what ways, if at all, do you identify uh, with or acknowledge your cultural heritage? I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, as a Chinese American, I've grown up with the model minority myth. And in many ways, this feeds into the idea that we kind of just fit with the white people. It, we're moderately successful and I kind of fit that stereotype. And coupled with the Chinese cultural idea that you don't make waves, you stay quiet and you just put up with things. Um, it's hard sometimes to acknowledge when there are cases of racism. It's easy to dismiss being set apart as Asian as something that actually is internalized stereotypes of Asians. So growing up, I had the normal Asian child experience of kids pulling their eyes and making fun of eyes, calling me by derogatory names like chink. Um, and this affected me to the point where I stopped playing with neighborhood kids when I was four because this happened. Then also while I've escaped many of the overt racist aggressions that other people of color in the States have experienced, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning or just plain ignorance that you experience, kind of following what Dr. Okamoto said with people asking, how long have you been a Christian? But there's the question of, well, where are you really from? Or the comment, your English is really good. Um, there, there's even ideas that, oh, you're Asian, so you must know Kung Fu, or just people mistaking me for the other Asian girl. 
in a more lived experience kind of beyond the church. I think something that's been even more problematic than things that you could just attribute as people just being ignorant and not really meaning anything badly about it. But there's kind of a fetishization of Asian females. There's and there's been times where if I'm walking alone, I've had people honk and proposition me, offer me money, circle their cars around and follow me. I've had incidents where people kind of minorly stalked me in college because they had yellow fever and I was an Asian female. And so they would sit in the cafeteria and just stare at me and follow me around campus. So even getting married, my white husband was asked how he got an Asian bride. So even though I haven't had racially profiling that has caused people to think of me as a criminal, it's still harmful to experience some of the stereotypes around being Asian. Um, th thanks for sharing that and for, for your honesty with that. You know, one thing that it brought up was uh, uh, Dr. Whiteford brought up was, you know, this uh, idea of, you know, stereotypes um, that, that Asian Americans might face. Um, you know, part of that ties into uh, this, this uh, phrase you may have heard, the model minority myth. Um, you know, this idea um, that, uh, you know, Asian Americans have been broadly painted as, as successful and uh, there have been unfair uh, comparisons to other uh, ethnic groups. Um, and, and there are a lot of factors that come into play uh, with why uh, that myth has been perpetuated, uh, including, uh, you know, lots of things that uh, we can include in, in an article that the LRJ team will uh, post here in the comments so that you can uh, read some more uh, about that. Uh, but thanks again for sharing. Um, uh, Reverend uh, Tim Beyer, uh, again, LCMS pastor uh, in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I'm going to pose this to, to you as well as uh, Reverend Travis Yee, uh, who's in Glen Cove. Uh, you know, as pastors of predominantly white churches and a predominantly white church body, have you felt pressure, uh, you know, real or perceived to, to act in a certain way? Uh, and in what ways, if at all, do you identify with or um, acknowledge your cultural heritage? Uh, starting with uh, uh, Reverend Byer. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going first here? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if it, it's ever been a, a conscious pressure, but maybe uh, one of those those pressures or influences that, that just kind of grind away over time. Uh, I, I grew up in a, in a white community. Um, I, I honestly thought I was white uh, all the way up, probably through midway uh, through college, where I really kind of wrestled with with that Asian identity and what all that meant. Uh, I was adopted at the young age of six months. And so um, on one hand, I really didn't feel any pressure because of that moder or that model sort of reality uh, where we just sort of, uh, as a family, assimilated um, and integrated. Of course, um, you know, uh, coming out of race riots and everything, there, there was that cultural push to be culture blind or colorblind. And so uh, kind of living through that as a child, um, you know, and now translating that into the church, you know, I, I, I do pick up um, at times questions that, that are posed to me that aren't typically maybe asked but, uh, to every, every pastor. Um, I, I remember there was a time uh, in, not, in the not so distant past where uh, my, my immigration status was, was questioned uh, back when all that was really big in the news. And, you know, do I have a green card and how can we know that your degree is for real? And, and all that, which was kind of surreal. Um, it was about the time when when we had our second child and it just kind of hit me. I'm like, wow, I, I'm gonna have to wrestle with this on, on a personal level in a different sort of way. Um, you know, how, how do I identify and acknowledge that cultural heritage? Uh, honestly, being an adoptee, I, I'm learning what that means. Uh, moving here to Tacoma, it was actually one of the personal draws because we have a, a fairly large, Korean population here in Tacoma, uh, certainly with just the Pacific Northwest and the culture that we have connected to to Asia, um, you know, military community, and it's uh, it's a very rich in Asian diversity, which which is intriguing to me, and and I've been able to immerse myself in a lot of those cultural pieces that I'm learning. Um, on one hand, what in a way it sounds weird, but what I've missed, but other other ways, like how do you how do you 
uh, how, how do you live as an Asian in America and yet um, in a very, very tenuous time between cultures and races, and especially in the Lutheran church um, that is primarily predominantly white. Um, you know, it's this ebb and flow between feeling uh, like you're always riding the wave between, okay, uh, what do you see and what do I see and, and how, how do we experience all this? How about you, Travis? What, what have you experienced? Well, it's kind of different because, um, you know, in the Atlanta district, we're kind of a big melting pot. So, uh, you know, my my mom brought me to True Light Lutheran Church. It's a very predominantly Chinese church to be baptized. And you get baptized and you're 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 attending church and it's, it's everybody's Chinese. And then all of a sudden we uh, we go to another church, another Missouri Synod church, and it's predominantly a small uh, Caucasian German church. And when you're the only kind of Asian family, you kind of singled out really easily. Oh, there they are. And it was, um, but you know, my home church didn't see us as Asians. They just saw us as, as, uh, members of the church. And, um, you know, again, there, there are so many predominantly different nationalities in New York city. It didn't really affect me going to Concordia college. It didn't affect me. But then when you really go to like, you know, when I attended the seminary, that was a, a big, uh, big difference um, where you're one out of like, I guess we had over 100 students and, you know, one of a, of a minority. And then, Tim, you're, I think, a year after me. So you probably understand that, too. There, were, there weren't many Asians uh, in our class. Um, yeah. And, you know, we we. You know, we had Dr. Okamoto there, but uh, other than that, it, it wasn't a, a lot of us. <laughs> so you can, again, feel like kind of singled out quite easily. And I did, again, it didn't bother me. I was from New York. We had our, uh, we're, we have our own uh, causes. But, you know, the one thing that always affected me, and I don't, I, I'm not going to say it was racist, but, you know, <laughs> I was at the seminary and, uh, you know, it was like probably the first weekend you're, you're filing out your information and, I guess the seminary is not used to having that many Asians because uh, the first thing that, you know, you're right, yeah, they have nationality was like Caucasian. I guess it's just the seminary is just so used to having Caucasians. <laughs> they have enough Asians there. So you know, that that for me was a little hurtful that, you know, not knowing that you have other nationalities in your church body. But, you know, I, I've always been in uh, predominantly Caucasian churches. And for myself, I try not to, you know, be... The, the Chinese person. I try to make sure that I'm just just like everybody else. I, I, I'm a Christian. I'm a sinner. Um, but, you know, it still gets the uh, hurtfulness, even when I'm wearing the clerical. Right? I'm, I'm a little overdressed for this kind of uh, panel. But, you know, the one thing that I try to try not to separate is my my pastor life and my uh, my Asian life. But, you know, what's no matter what, it's always like the one thing, no matter being in New York, the, the, the one question that always, I guess, upsets me uh, being Chinese is that, where were you born? Like, I was born here. <laughs> I was born here. Why do I have to be born somewhere else? I was born here. Uh, I, I didn't get my green card. I have, I have a full social security card. I was born here. Um, and I guess the other thing is that always you know, is hurtful is like being called a different nationality than what I am. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to blame ignorance, but I'm just, uh, it's just hurtful after, you know, I guess 38 years for myself. But, you know, culturally, I, I'm still close to Chinatown here in New York City and still try to raise my my kids uh, culturally in, in some, you know, Chinese uh, format. Um, you know, but it's, it's it, you know, it has been hurtful. My wife is Caucasian and uh, there have been several times where, you know, she would bring the kids. And then the first question that she gets asked is, where did you adopt your kids? <laughs> and that, you know, sometimes is hurtful for her as well as uh, for myself, because I've even gotten asked that. Where did you adopt your kids? And I'm thinking um, God gave me the kids. So I'm not sure where I adopted them from. Uh, thanks uh, for those responses, uh, Tim and Travis. And I, I think what we're hearing from you know both of your responses there is there's this nuance uh, is what I'm hearing you know in this question of like uh, you know holding on to uh, you know maybe a cultural heritage and respecting that, but also going like 
hey, I'm an, I'm American. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that brings up a, a topic that, uh, you know, we posted an article in the chat there to talk about this relationship and, in, in, you know, uh, kind of sometimes it happens, uh, forced cultural assimilation versus, um, you know, the other tension of, uh, like uh, Travis was saying of, hey, I was born in American, uh, America, I am American, um, and, and kind of how to wrestle with uh, some of those ideas and the history, um, history around those as well. Um, uh, Sarah Saying, uh, thanks for being here, admissions coordinator at uh, Concordia Seminary St. Louis. Um, you worked in the office of the president at Concordia, Wisconsin, uh, and as an intern for the youth ministry office, and you're helping to plan the next national youth gathering. Um, and you also uh, read a book for LRJ Reads uh, in the Hmong language. Um, and then your father was also the first uh, Hmong pastor uh, ordained in uh, the LCMS. Can you share a, a bit more about what it's like uh, to be carrying on your family's LCMS Lutheran tradition uh, as well as their cultural heritage? So, um, no, I was born to the LCMS and grew up in it um, and, uh, you know, grew grew to love it. And, um, you know, being a PK, right, um, I saw my dad and my mom uh, out in ministry, right, really doing God's work. Um, and then all of the things you just listed off in the last couple of years, being able to be a part of uh, those efforts and groups and different spaces within the LCMS has um, really given me a full spectrum and, and view and all these different perspectives um, of the LCMS. And so I've learned a lot uh, from all those experiences. But um, yeah, as far as uh, the Lutheran heritage, you know, that's that's rooted in me um, and growing up with that with me and my siblings and a uh, combination of, you know, seeing my dad, as you mentioned, you know, first uh, Hmong L LCMS ordained pastor. Um, he was such a pioneer um, for the Hmong community um, in the LCMS, um, but also just the multi-ethnic and minority space for which he was really pushing for um, that is well-deserved um, for these groups um, within the LCMS. And so um, just growing up and now being a part of a lot of things, um, it's just a deep desire to continue to stay active and involved within the LCMS and to um, contribute, you know, what I can um, to the church and to see it continue to diversify and expand um, in the future. As, par as far as my Hmong heritage, um, you know, maintaining that um, is a joy, but also um, a challenge for sure. So like, for example, right now, my family lives in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, there's, there are no Hmong people here. There is no Hmong community. And so we really just live in this kind of um, mixture of Hmong American kind of culture. And we just maintain um, that culture as we can at home with ourselves. Um, I think something that is uh, unique to being a Hmong American, you know, here in America is that uh, depending on where you go, where you live, uh, people may not have ever heard of Hmong people. And so um, I think we are a prime example of um, the fact that the Asian community is so broad and diverse and is filled with so many, you know, vast languages and cultures and ethnicities. And so I think it's, there's something to be said about really um, getting to know people and their personal heritage. Um, it's different for each person. And um, you know, I would be more than happy to um, share about my heritage um, if people are willing to ask and want to get to know me. So I think there's something uh, unique about that. Uh, thanks for thanks for sharing that. Um, and, and speaking of, as Sarah did there, uh, you know, the, uh, the the wide diversity that there is within these catch-alls of Asian and American Pacific Islander. We have uh, Kevin C.K. Berg. Uh, with us this evening, who is uh, Pacific Islander descent and also um, an artist, uh, a theater director, and actor. Uh, I feel like a lot of times in these conversations, uh, uh, you know, we, we forget about vocations, you know, outside of the church. And so I'm really interested to hear, um, you know, a bit about uh, your perspective 
um, especially um, since you wrote and directed a play uh, about a future world where Hawaii becomes its own independent nation. Um, can you tell us a bit about the play and how the subject matter uh, is pushed? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so the play itself was called A House Divided. And it was set up in this hypothetical future where uh, the Hawaiian people regained their sovereignty as a nation. A lot of people don't know that Hawaii was a completely sovereign nation, recognized as one of the fam part of the family of nations, recognized by Great Britain, France, Germany in the early 19th century, and that it was actually illegally overthrown uh, by a group of businessmen with the help of the U.S. military uh, in 1893. And so it was talking about this question of that is constantly in uh, Native Hawaiian circles of what does sovereignty mean and how can we get it back? Because many Native Hawaiians still feel that America is illegally occupying them because they were the illegal coup happened, they were annexed by the U.S., and eventually statehood came uh, in the 1950s. So for me, I, I've lived in Hawaii, but I've spent most of my upbringing here in the upper Midwest, you know, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And so the play itself was really a culmination of this question of identity, because I, you know, like so many of the other panelists, I've also found myself as the only one often in a situation. Uh, you know, there will be times where uh, people don't even know how to place me. You know, they assume that I'm either Native American or I'm Latinx. Uh, and I'm like, actually, I'm Hawaiian. And they're like, oh. You mean like with hula and pineapples? And it's like, it's a lot more than that. But so the play was the culmination of that. And the play itself was an immersive piece. So which means that the audience was part of the action. And it took place at this, this gala um, that was to celebrate this Hawaiian government that was reinstated. And it was inspired by... Uh, in 2016, 2015, 2016, there was actually movement to create a uh, native Hawaiian government within kind of the state structure. And it was asking what would happen there. And then it was also asking another question about extremism and what happens when our ideals go too far. So the gala itself ends up becoming a hostage situation. Uh, and there's actually a really good two interviews, uh, one for Hawaii Public Radio, and then another one that you could probably look up if you type my name uh, that we did on the piece itself. And so it really uh, wrestling with where am I in this place and time, being often the only representative of Hawaii to most people I see. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for sharing about that. Yeah, we did uh, post uh, in the chat there that public radio interview, and I definitely encourage you. Um, yeah, there's uh, other other great interviews um, out there uh, about the play. It's a, it's a fascinating play. Um, uh, love love learning about it. Um, I do want to shift real quick before we go to the Q and A. I want to remind: if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and, and we'll get as many of them as we can uh, answered here. Uh, before we get to that, I did wanna uh, come back to, I know uh, Dr. Whiteford uh, mentioned a little bit about this, but uh, this past year's uh, rise in discrimination and hate crimes uh, have disproportionately affected Asian American women. Um, and whether or not uh, uh, Dr. Whiteford or, or Sarah, if you've experienced discrimination firsthand, uh, could you speak a bit about how these public incidents uh, have made an impact on you? And uh, maybe we'll start with Dr. Whiteford if you're ready. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll need you to unmute there. There we go. So this year, this last year since COVID flu has hit has kind of been the scariest year for me to be an Asian American. Um, part of this was that when COVID hit last March in the States, I was pregnant, so I felt very vulnerable. and. So currently, even though I teach for Concordia Irvine, my family actually lives in Oklahoma and we're 
in Tulsa, which is a city that experiences great segregation and divisiveness to this day. Um, you can look up the Tulsa Race Massacre if you want to see some of that history. But it means that we, my husband and our family, we chose to live on the wrong side of town. And my husband's a teacher. And he had students and coworkers who knew that his family was Asian, but still engaging in very heavy anti-Asian rhetoric and expressing a lot of anger. Um, I know one of his students said, if he saw an Asian person, he was going to punch that Asian person. So there's, there's this kind of anti-Asian rhetoric that feels very scary. I wouldn't go on a walk um, around our neighborhood without my husband around. And even when I did, I wore a huge sun hat because I didn't want people to easily be able to see that I was Asian because I didn't want to be a scapegoat for all the tenseness that people felt. And similarly with the Atlanta spa murders, this kind of has brought back these feelings of being other and scapegoat or potential scapegoat that people will look to Asians or any other group in an attempt to kind of lessen their own discomfort that they feel. And in the case of the Atlanta murders, it makes me think a lot about Christianity and how it's practiced in the US. Um, namely that this murderer hyper-individualized Christianity so much that he needed to get rid of a temptation. And he did that by scapegoating Asians or those women who, those establishments that were Asian. And he choose, chose this over dying to himself and loving others. So I guess for me, this is all this is a reminder that racism isn't just a white problem, but it's a sin problem. Being a minority doesn't mean that I'm devoid of racism or prejudice, but we're all, as Christians, we need to examine ourselves for any bitterness, any prejudices, and realize that we're broken and we're sinful and we're in need of confession and in need of practicing hospitality and openness to our neighbors. What what has your experience been like, Sarah? Yeah, you know, um, I think one thing about this panel is that we're we're here to be honest, right? And Honestly, I am still figuring out exactly how I feel. You know, I think um, it changes sometimes. I can tell you that this past year has been like a buildup, right, of a lot of horrible things. And then the last week or two has just been um, really heavy and I've been confused and uh, makes you question a lot. Um, I feel hurt, um, but I can't it's like I'm still processing things for sure. Um, you know, these incidents make you think about what you put up with, right? What I've put up with um, growing up and um, even recently. Um, and just, I'm kind of at the place where, um, you know, I'm, I'm still processing a lot of things um, and I think that's okay. Um, it's nice to be like, okay, this, this happened let's do this and this and this. Um, but sometimes you just kind of have to feel the hurt too and um, process how you feel and um, figure things out. So um, it's been it's been a lot, but we're, we're all kind of learning too. Even the Asian American community, we're kind of learning and we're figuring things out. Um, and we might not have all the answers, but um, we're having to think through a lot right now. That's a really good point. Another reason I'm so grateful uh, that this group uh, joined this conversation tonight. Um, I know it's no easy thing to do uh, as, as we're all pro processing this um, and and uh, especially for this group. So thanks. Thanks again for taking the time. Um, moving to uh, uh, some audience questions. Um, first one uh, we have here um, and I'll open this up to the group and um, you know, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, anyone to jump in. I do think, you know, uh, Pastor Byer, this one uh, might uh, might be one you could speak to. How can I best support my adopted Asian children when I am of a different cultural background? Reverend Byer, do you feel comfortable jumping in? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if I have a silver bullet. Um, you know, as I reflect on my childhood, um, 
I, I think the biggest gift my parents, uh, who are who are 100% German, I mean, through and through, um, that they gave me as an adoptee was was the space to ask questions. Um, they they didn't step on my toes. Uh, they didn't force like, hey, you got to pick and choose. Um, and looking back, I, I, it was really uncomfortable growing up because, yeah, you know, you, you knew there was something different, but you couldn't really articulate it. You couldn't put your thumb on it. Um, but when I was able to articulate those questions, uh, they, they gave me the gift of time and space to really just sit and, and not to give answers, um, but, but just to sit there with me. And it goes back to what Dr. Okamoto started with, you know. Uh, the gift of empathy goes a long way. Uh, so I, I think just off the top of my head, that, that'd be one way that, that you know, somebody from a different culture, a different race, a different life experience may uh, be able to, um, to connect with those adopted children um, would be that empathy. Um, you know, and, and as I think now, now as, as my children, you know, biracial children, my, my wife is Caucasian. Um, you know, I, they, they, they're asking a lot of questions. Uh, our oldest is in third grade. And I don't remember asking the questions he's asking as a kid. Um, but we're in a different time, a different place. And, and that conversation's at the forefront. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's a day that goes by without somebody asking him a question that he doesn't really know how to respond to. And on one hand, it really breaks my heart because it means that he's probably growing up a whole lot faster than I did when it comes to this conversation. Um, but it's also just that special, sweet time to sit and again create that space uh, to share that empathy. Not, you know, there's no easy answer. There's no quick answer. I'm not even sure if there is a clear cut answer. Uh, but to to process that together and uh, in an appropriate way, and always point back to Jesus. You know, as as people of faith, um, that, that that's an awesome opportunity as as a parent, uh, as you're walking with kids, just to. To connect it to Jesus and the hope that we have in Him, and that in Jesus um, we don't have to have all the answers. Grace abounds. Thanks for that. Um, the the next question uh, we're actually getting a lot of variations on this, um, so I'm going to kind of combine them for Dr. Uh, Okamoto. Um, there's a lot of people asking, you know, what can our uh, churches do? What can our schools do? Um, and is there anything, you know, on the on the seminary level in terms of, you know? Uh, fostering, you know, greater cultural awareness and empathy. Um, you know, is there anything that uh, you feel like we can, you know, help uh, pass on to pastors as they go out into various, you know, congregations around the country? Yeah, thanks. That's, uh, those are terrific questions. Uh, so I'll pick up on something that Tim said, uh, and it's about Jesus. Uh, uh, but the Christian Church is a, a unique community in the world. Uh, we're people of you know, many tribes, many nations, many races, many languages, uh, but under one Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. And that one of the great gifts that the church can give to the world, uh, believing and unbelieving, uh, it is our lives as, as one people. Uh, that's not easy. Uh, but not only does it give glory to God and honor to our Lord, uh, but it is of a, a benefit to, to to the world, which has uh, always been divided along national, well, ethnic, linguistic lines like that. Uh, and I, I think that's that's that our church is working toward that, living together. Uh, trying to be one people uh, to borrow from the, <laughs> you know, from our American language under God, but under our, our one God is, is a, is a terrific thing. Uh, as a, as speaking to, about the seminary, uh, four years ago, we, we went, we launched a, a new curriculum and, uh, or a revised one, and it gave uh, more attention to and deliberate attention to all of the, uh, ministerial formation students, so uh, pastoral formation, deaconess students uh, on, on certain things like spiritual formation, also personal traits. And one of those is cultural awareness uh, and stressing 
matters like empathy and cultural humility. Uh, and so we definitely have, uh, all of us have, have in small groups talked about this. Uh, we had a, a convocation about racism this year, specifically in wake of uh, the unrest of, of last year. And it, it continues. And it's been, of course, for, for such a long time in the United States. Uh, those are things that we've tried and we still try to push toward them. Uh, of course, we have a, well, we always will have a long way to go. And this is, comes back to finally, uh, we're, we're people who have been forgiven and uh, therefore are and will continue to be forgiving and living under that uh, itself is, a, is a, a good, if sometimes really challenging thing. Thanks for that. And, um, you know, I guess I, we could mention uh, the uh, Concordia Seminary St. Louis has a multicultural symposium uh, coming up uh, this spring. Um, I am sorry that I don't have the date on me right now, but in the chat, we'll, we'll post a link uh, for more information uh, about that. Um, this is a question I'll, I'll pose a, a little more um, generally. Um, you know, how, how do we in, um, uh, you know, uh, predominantly white church body, you know, make sure that in our congregations, um, you know, we are uh, welcoming. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, Reverend Yi, um, you know, especially since you talked about, um, you know, hey, I see myself uh, as American and, and, and aren't all, I'm not always seen that way. Um, is there anything that you feel like you've learned or that you're processing about, you know, welcoming in, uh, you know, multicultural congregations and communities like that? Uh, I mean, for myself, um, it's, you know, I try, you know, as, as an Asian American, try not to, I guess, focus too much on my eyes. And, um, but it's like the first thing people notice <laughs> is my eyes. Um, and I always try to look beyond the eyes, look beyond the, the skin color. Um, at the, like Dr. Ruth said, you know, it, growing up it was either you're caucasian or you're african-american and, and to be in the middle was it was difficult because you, you couldn't really find a side you, you're either too white uh as a as a caucasian or too dark and, and you know that is the probably the toughest part of uh, you know sometimes being asian in a white community um but you know like my home church they just welcomed us they didn't they didn't they were very german very german in such a way they had german services i mean i could still remember growing up uh singing you know some of the great hymns in german and wondering what is going on as a kid but um they were just very welcoming they didn't they didn't look at my eyes they didn't care they were just happy to have a family uh and happy to have uh people who want to hear uh the good news of jesus christ um and that is what has always been my focus um you know, reaching out, not looking at, at skin color or, um, you know, nationality uh, in my church uh, and hope and my church doesn't do that either. My church doesn't. Uh, they, they look at a shepherd who is fallible, who uh, messes up at times. And I'm not the most perfect uh, pastor. Uh, I try to be. But, you know, I, you've heard sin is still there. And um, I just want to be not just known as the, you know, Chinese pastor or the Asian American pastor. I, I, and I try to, you know, focus that we just be a church that welcomes all people, um, no matter what our nationality is, no, or where you're born or where you've lived in your life. And um, I think if we can, uh, you know, focus uh, our mission, I mean, you know, scripture doesn't tell us about, you know, reaching out certain uh, nationalities, just reach out and uh, make disciples of all nations. And that's that's been my focal point of uh, being a Chinese American and uh, an LCMS pastor. Um, thanks for that. We're still, uh, you know, taking these questions uh, from the audience here. And so I'm going to I'm going to keep moving. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, but uh, Kevin, uh, real quick, uh, from your time uh, that you did spend in, in Hawaii, uh, can you speak uh, at all about uh, what race relations are, are like uh, in Hawaii, um, where, you know, there's there's a lot of, you know, uh, people who are of, of mixed race um, and just kind of some of the dynamics might be different? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, 
I know that we we think of big cities on the continent as melting pots, but if you really want to see a, div- a diverse melting pot, going to Hawaii, uh, specifically Honolulu, is to see truly everyone. It's it's where there is almost um, no majority, no minority. And so, because you have so many people who are, you know, come from out of the country, so many people who are half this and half that, that it truly is a melting pot. Uh, But there's still those traces of, um, of racial biases, and there's still the feel of otherness uh, that occurs. What, and one of the most interesting things is that even though um, socially it's very diverse, uh, an example, you know, just from my vocation in the theater, it's still very Caucasian centric. Um, even though we are at the crossroads between, you know, America and Asia, there is still so much work that is, uh, you know, written by Caucasians, performed by Caucasians. And so it's weird because on one hand, there's this strange diversity. I remember uh, something that we had some friends visit while I was in grad school uh, and they were both Caucasian and they looked around and they were like, is this what it feels like? And I said, sometimes, yeah. And yet that feeling of otherness for Asian Americans, for, for Polynesians, for Pacific Islanders, um, because, you know, we are in America, it still feels that there, you know, that otherness still creeps in. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's really helpful. There's lots of people in the chat mentioning that they're uh, learning a lot about uh, Hawaiian history tonight that, uh, you know, wasn't the, the typical uh, part of the curriculum uh, growing up in our life. Um, Dr. Woodford, I kind of want to um, uh, step back because I know, you know, in, in some things you'd shared, you talked about, um, you know, wrestling with, you know, fitting in while also, um, you know, respecting your own uh, Chinese American uh, heritage. Uh, can you speak a, a bit about, um, uh, you know, being uh, in, a, in a church setting and, and what it means to welcome uh, all cultures. So I actually did not get born into the Lutheran church. I came to Lutheran church um, at about 20 years old. And one of the things that struck me most about that congregation that kind of brought me into the LCMS was that this church was engaged in a lot of mercy ministry. Um, the neighborhood had changed demographically And the church, instead of deciding to move their building, they decided to embrace the people that were there in that neighborhood. So when I came to that church, they had a Hispanic congregation that met, they had a Liberian congregation, and they had a Hmong congregation. And on top of that, the church was working a lot with immigrants, particularly immigrants from um, Burma, and helping them get settled in our city. And so I think that one of the ways that we can address welcoming and practicing hospitality to people who aren't always from a Caucasian or a German background is to engage in our neighborhoods and to not look so much to our church body as it stands right now. And in doing so, that I think opens a lot of doors because they see God's love and the image of Christ through these relationships that are formed. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that that perspective. Um, we've got we've got time for a, a couple more questions from the from the audience here. Um, so hitting another one, um, and this is for the entire group here. Um, you know, we touched on it a little bit, um, but you know, how if you're comfortable, how did you feel or, or react to? Uh, the prejudice that the scapegoating, um, you know, that happened at the beginning of the pandemic when, uh, you know, some wrongly blamed uh, Asian Americans, uh, you know, for uh, for the outbreak.
And I understand I'm putting everyone on the spot. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say something. So it's about a year ago I came across, started come reading about these things, and I was stunned. Uh, for instance, there was one in the New York Times um, and it talked, among other things, about uh, Chinese Americans going to gun shops and buying. And it ended up with one man. He's, I'm thinking about buying an AR-15 style rifle. Like, wow. Uh, I mean, that kind of that kind of fear. Uh, and this was a year ago. Uh, I I admit I was stunned at that uh, because this had to do with a pandemic and what kind of leap is happening. And uh, some of it says probably about my own, I don't know, ignorance and blindness to this, but that, that was mine. Yeah. Did anybody else have a, have a reaction or no, no pressure? I think it's, I, it, the, it's it, the scapegoat thing didn't just happen at the beginning of the pandemic. It's still ongoing. And I think, you know, with all cases of racism in, in America, there's a the question of, well, who's speaking up? So I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I was on a group chat on Facebook and someone was sharing non-verified information, you know, avoid Chinese people, avoid Chinese food. They can all carry the coronavirus. My, my friend who has a husband who works at the CDC says so. And, you know, nobody spoke up. And that, in a sense, I thought was painful because these were all people that I knew and nobody said, wait a second, what, what is really happening? And this was a, the time where at least in my city, the majority of cases were actually coming from travelers to Italy, not from Chinese people at all. So there's the sense of, well, who, who, who cares? Who sees me? Am I just the invisible minority here? That's a good point. Well, oh, sorry. Go for it. Yeah, no, go for it. well, in New York, New York, it was very different. New York was, um, you know, the hot spot. We had, we had March and April was a crazy time here in New York. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one incident just like, you know, shopping because um, I had to do all the food shopping. My, my wife, Phyllis, um, you know, has a autoimmune disease. So it was just, you know, I did all the shopping, but it, it felt weird because you can you hear all, all the Chinese uh, stuff being said and uh, you, you just felt I just felt like eyes were on me. And as I'm walking in the supermarket, you know, I'm wearing I'm wearing the mask even before masks were like, you know, told to do so. And you know, people walking past me, like saw my saw me and they would cover up faster or just turn away. And it just it, that kind of hurt, you know, especially again, being in New York, you know, we you would think it's it's quite different. But, um, you know, dealing with that during the past year and having the eyes on you uh, kind of hurt me a little bit uh, being here in New York. Um, but that's that's what I had to deal with. Uh, during this, you know, COVID time. Yeah, that that's very similar to to what happened here in Seattle, Tacoma. Um, I remember going to a large uh, box store, and and it was sort of this avoidance. Um, and, and I really didn't know what was said at that point in time. Like I, I was kind of ignorant of what was going on, and like, oh, this is kind of strange. And and yet my wife just walked right on in. Um, I, I remember at one time getting cussed out by somebody in the frozen food section. And uh, I was just kind of taken back. I'm like, whoa, what, what's going on? And, you know, being a pastor, I'm like, this is stuff that makes headlines. So disengage, walk away. Don't, don't even, don't even try because everybody has their phone out. Um, it, it was just kind of a surreal experience at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and I, I remember coming home after that, that event. And, you know, since then there's been a couple other, interesting uh, uh, experiences getting cussed out in a store or, uh, you know, walking down the street and somebody yells something out. Um, and, and for me, it just leaves me heartbroken. Like, you know, how, how do you begin engaging with so much anger? 
Um, and, you know, there's, there's our part, there's their part. And of course there's God's part. And so, you know, um, the question I I'm left with is what, what is my part in all this? Um, certainly there's their part and, um, you know, what, what do I need to trust God for and for his part? Because, uh, for any type of reconciliation and resolution, man, it, it's gonna have to it's gonna have to rely on God. Well, and I, I want to ask. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I want to ask about that that uh, real quick because you know I've uh, heard about some uh, real you know incidents that that um, you know of either discrimination or shunning or um, you know actual hate speech uh, that this group has talked about. Um, but then there's also been, you know, some comments about it also hurting when people didn't say anything, uh, when when people didn't speak up. Um, can you talk a, a bit about that in terms of, you know, people who may be watching this? Um, uh, again, you know, we're in a, a predominantly white church body. Um, why does that matter? You know, why does why does the speaking up part of it? What is saying something matter? And again, I know we're, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> and I'm also asking a somewhat leading question. Um, maybe I'll real quick, and I'm, I'm only gonna bring it up uh, to you, Dr. Whiteford, because uh, you mentioned uh, that it hurt uh, when, when people in your group didn't speak up. Uh, can, can you just speak about why, why particularly that hurt? Um, I also saw that Dr. Okamoto has something to say. And I will let them, him speak because my child just entered the room. So hold on. Please do. Please do. Thanks for saving the day, Dr. Alcumar. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I had this experience uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and it was the uncomfortableness of uh, bringing up uh, a matter about, you know, race, ethnicity, when you're the only one in the room. Uh, and that uh, when, when no one else seems to see it, uh, you, you stand out, you're drawing attention to yourself in the wrong way. Uh, and I, well, finally it did come up and that was, that was fine. And, and so I'll speak for myself because like some of the others here, uh, my experience about race and in the church especially uh, didn't really hit me until I was at Concordia Seminary. I won't explain why, and it isn't a bad one, but it, it is a matter of more awareness and uncomfortableness. And this goes back to what I was saying about empathy, that uh, if all of us can try to put ourselves in other people's shoes, uh, we would find ourselves more trusting, more open, and uh, in, in these kinds of things, I think that's really important. Thanks for that. Um, we've got time for two quick questions. I'm gonna do my best to squeeze them in here. Um, uh, real quick to uh, to Sarah, uh, you know, I know you've worked, uh, you know, at Concordia, Wisconsin, and also with the, the National Youth Gathering. Um, can you speak about uh, a bit about, you know, with uh, with schools, with our young people, um, how how can we, um, you know, help, uh, you know, greater cultural awareness, empathy for some of these issues that we're talking about that a lot of us, you know, are learning about, whether it's from a history or just a cultural context. Um, is there anything you feel that that we could do um, to to help? you know, move forward in those ways in our schools. Yeah, I think um, that's something that uh, my family has been thinking about a lot. Um, I have two younger brothers. Uh, they're both at Lutheran schools here in St. Louis. And um, I would say that it really starts with the teachers and the staff. Um, I mean, these kids are young, they're growing, they're learning every single day. They're soaking up so much. And so um, I think a lot of it lies with teachers and staff to have um, a certain amount of cultural competency and also willingness to continue a learning, whether that looks like training, whether that's just having some conversations. Um, they're the ones that are watching their kids all the time. They see the interactions. And so I feel like a lot of that you know, pressure does rely on um, the teachers and their awareness of everything, um, being able to call things out to support kids um, as they're in these classrooms. So I think that's a huge part of it. Thanks for that. Um, and then I've got a, a, a kind of a, a tough question, uh, Reverend Byron, I'm bringing it up because you had asked or you had mentioned 
um, you know, growing up in a time uh, during uh, race riots. And we're obviously coming out of a year um, where, um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement and, uh, you know, uh, police violence has been an issue in that way. And there's there's this interesting tension, right? Um, because there's uh, violence happening against uh, Asian American communities. Um, but then we've also questioned, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, the police violence that's happened over the past year in, in Black communities. Um, is there anything uh, that, that you can speak of? I know there is a history um, of tension. There's an article we put in the chat about some of the, the way that, uh, you know, this model minority myth has been used as a wedge issue uh, between uh, Black Americans and Asian Americans. Um, can, can you speak to that tension at all, you know, specifically since you mentioned growing up uh, in the shadow of the race rights? I, I think the tension um, from my experience has become so innate that it's really hard to separate it from from uh, what I would perceive as reality. Um, you know, what 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 is what is the narrative that was taught versus what's the what's uh, the underlying true narrative? Um, I, I'd have to give that some more thought, Josh. That's an excellent question um, because. You know that's that's kind of how culture works, right? It, it just usually doesn't snap into to clarity. Uh, usually, it's something that evolves over time and builds and builds and builds, and you really don't know something's different until it begins falling apart. Um, you know, for, for for me, growing up in rural Nebraska, and then moving to suburban Detroit, Michigan, Metro Detroit. Uh, I think that was probably the biggest eye-opening experience because you know Midwest, you're you're, you're kind of you know, you're pretty chill. Like like even if you do have thoughts, you kind of keep them to yourself. Uh, Detroit's a little different. Uh, you, you never doubt how people feel, at least in the community I was in. So if somebody felt uncomfortable, they just said, "I'm really uncomfortable around you," and they walk away. It's like, what in the world was that? Um, and so you you, you kind of lose that sort of I guess Midwest cultural nice once you get into some areas of the country. Uh, the same is true here in Tacoma. It's like people know if they like you or not uh, because they will let you know. Um, but yeah, I, you know my my experience with um, kind of the color blindness or ethnically blind or blind uh, sort of reality. I think it's. It's so unique and individual, uh, both to the person, but also to the local community, and and certainly the way that that your environment is shaped. Um, you know, that's going to be different. Yeah. No. Thanks for thanks for your honesty with that. Um, you know, something that that maybe worth looking into. There's a video we're posting uh, in the chat that gives a, a bit of uh, more history uh, around some of the things that we talked about tonight, um, including um, you know the the way that, um, you know, different communities have been used as wedges to, to, to uh, pit them against each other um, and something that may be worth looking into. Uh, this is all very nuanced, obviously, uh, conversation that we're having here. Um, we do need to wrap things up. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, real quick, if we could keep it to 30 seconds, um, you know, whether it's a, uh, a, a book, a movie, a podcast, or even just some, hey, here here's my last bit of advice. If you're interested in in you know learning more um, uh, about Asian American culture or any of the topics we've talked tonight, um, here's kind of uh, a word uh, to leave everybody with. Um, I, I think the great thing is the audience that we have here and and the Ruth and Racial Justice community is is really interested in being constructive, not just uh, pointing fingers, uh, but figuring out how we can learn and listen uh, and and kind of build a better future and a better church body together. Um, so I'm gonna uh, go around. I'm gonna ask for a volunteer first because I know I'm putting you guys on the spot. I guess I'll go. So one website that I have been looking at, um, their website and their social media, is the Asian American Christian Collaborative. So it's asianamericancollaborative.com. And so they've had different pages that include resources and statements on um, anti-Asian hate. And so that's one resource that I have been looking at personally as an Asian American. Uh, thanks for that. And by the way, if you if you don't have anything, I'm not going to force us to go all the way around. But I'll, I'll give a 
a chance for anyone else to break in if they want to. Um, oh yes, Dr. Okamoto, go for it. Yeah, I'll just mention uh, something to read. It's very short, but it picks up on something that was brought up earlier about, about the problem being sin. And it was in a, an op-ed piece by David Brooks in the New York Times. Mm. I think it was just a week ago. Uh, uh, I know the title is A Christian Vision of Social Justice. Uh, but it does try to talk, not just try. It actually brings up how uh, dealing with this as as sin is uh, how valuable it is, even just from a, I guess you might say, broadly speaking, secular perspective. And uh, I'll just commend that for thinking. Thanks for that. You know, in, in general, um, I, I've, I've been seeking out more Asian theologians, um, can, more contemporary Asian theologians. Uh, Sarah Shin has been somebody I've really grown to respect in her writing. She, she has a couple articles in Christianity Today, um, one where uh, she poses the question, have you ever seen an Asian, an Asian woman lead a Christian conference? Um, and the answer is probably not. And it just kind of, she, she asked the question, she works for InterVarsity, so um, uh, real, really talented voice. Uh, Sydney Park, Grace Kim, uh, Sun Wook Kim uh, wrote, wrote a really great uh, piece, uh, Jesus and the Missional Movement in Galilee and how it applies today. And so, um, you know, I, that, that's what my encouragement would be. Just seek out, seek out, you know, if you're into theology, if you're in, in that world, I'm assuming that's a, a large portion of our audience and, and why we're together here. Um, seek out those people of faith who, who are authoring in different contexts um, and, and lift up their voices, uh, whether you're a preacher or a teacher, you know, lift them up, point them out. Um, it, it just betters everybody. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I, we do need to wrap things up. Um, I'm going to leave with a, a couple recommendations myself that have just been uh, helpful uh, recently for me. Uh, the movie uh, Minari. Uh, I, could not recommend more about a, uh, a Korean family that immigrates to America and to the Midwest, um, really just uh, captures a place and time and a family uh, experience in that way and, and deals with a lot of the issues we talked about tonight. Um, also recommend a book, uh, it's a graphic novel, uh, Displacement, um, about uh, Japanese internment camps and uh, kind of a, a different twist on it where a, a modern woman actually travels back in time uh, to a time where her grandparent, uh, which is a true story, uh, uh, lived in internment camps and really a, a helpful way to think through uh, that part of American history. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone again for joining us. Thanks for going, letting us go a little bit over time. Uh, and thanks to everyone who joined in, in the audience as well. Um, this has been uh, super helpful for me. I hope it, hope it was for everyone else and uh, look forward to continuing these conversations again soon. Have a good evening. Thanks. <laughs>